Welcome back to the story of liberty. This is your host, John Bonat. Did you ever hear of a man named John Huss, H-U-S-S? The 15th century, he was one of the priests who was the queen's confessor. The queen used to go to him in private and tell John of her sins. John is also appointed to prove that any doctrines outside the church are heretical. But John does not succeed very well, for as he studies the question, he discovers that the monks and the friars are leading shameful lives. More than that, he begins to read the great Dr. Wycliffe's books, and the more he reads, the more he sees that Dr. Wycliffe is in the right and that even himself and the monks and the friars, the bishop and the pope, in the wrong. He sees that people ought to be permitted to read the Bible. He begins to preach. He's so eloquent and learned and sincere and earnest that the people flock in crowds to hear him. The monks and the friars, they're angry and they get the archbishop to come against him. But the archbishop is an ignorant man. They call him an ABC archbishop because he knows little more than the alphabet. The archbishop determines that the young priest, John Huss, although he is the personal confessor to the queen empress, he shall be disciplined. But there's a problem, see, because the king likes John Huss and he protects him. And he appoints him the lector to the University of Prague. The Pope is bent on getting John. But it's not easy to stop John Huss because the king is his friend. And the king doesn't care for the, the priest or the Pope. The Archbishop contends himself with gathering up all the books of Dr. Wycliffe that he could lay his hands upon, which have been translated into their language there in Bohemia, which is a place just in Central Europe, right where Austria, and Germany, and Poland border. And he's going to burn all these books that John Huss has written as well. He thinks if the books are burned, that will stop the spread of the heresy. The Archbishop imagines this. This in turn makes the Pope angry. So he issues orders to burn these books. But the King, however, he's not disturbed by the order. He directs the priest to go on with their preaching. He tells John Huss and his friend, Professor Fallfash, to keep preaching, and they do. Well, now the Pope is very angry and he orders the two men to appear at Rome to give an account of their doings, but they do not obey for they know that there is a very strong prison in Rome for such heretics as they the castle of St. Angelo. At this time, the emperor of Germany gets in the mix and he wants a council of cardinals and other church members to see if the church cannot be united under the one pope. The two heads are tearing each other apart. The cardinals meet, but they actually start fighting grabbing each other's throats. That was kind of common in the people in the streets during that time in the beer shops, but not between cardinals. The emperor of Germany desires a settlement of the troubles and through his assistance, his influence, a great council assembles in the old city of Switzerland, of Constance, Switzerland where all the questions in dispute are to be discussed. Never before was there such a gathering. The emperor comes in great state. The pope is there. There are seven patriarchs, 
20 archbishops, 20 cardinals in their red cloaks, 26 princesses, 91 bishops and 140 counts, hundreds of doctors of divinity, and many priests, 4,000 or more in all to come to the great assembly. Multiple, multitudes of people are filling the streets of the old town of Constance. They're making the old streets alive as never before. Peddlers, hucksters, tricksters, charlatans, tramps, beggars, they all flock to Constance. The council sits month after month to the great profit of all the storekeepers in the town, and the grocers are doing very well selling their products and their wares. During these months, while the council is in session, one man who came to attend, instead of taking part in its deliberations, is put in prison, John Huss. He came of his own free will because the emperor, the emperor of Germany invited him to attend. He asked him to come and he sent him a letter promising him protection and that he should be at liberty to come and go without molestation. And that no harm should come to him while in constant, yet he is in prison while the deliberations are going on. The man who has been preaching that they should lead pure lives and that the people have the right to confess their sins to God has been languishing in prison. How has it happened when he had the emperor's promise written out on parchment? Because now the pope claims and takes power over the emperor. He has the right of disposing emperors. He has the right to put John Huss wrongfully in prison. So finding John Huss in their power, the Pope and the Cardinals have thrust him into a dungeon, and now he is to pay the penalty for being a heretic, although he's really not. It is July 6, 1415, and all of Constance is a stir. People come from the country. They flock into the town. A heretic is to be roasted to death. And it must be early in the procession which will, they will see this man come to the front, John Huss. The streets are thronged with people. The women look down from their old quaint old windows to catch a glimpse of the wicked man as they suppose him to be. They see a man of 40 years of age. The procession winds through the streets and they enter the great hall. The emperor is there wearing a, a golden crown. At his right hand sits the Duke of Bavaria holding a cross. At his left hand is the governor of the castle of Nuremberg with the drawn sword. Around the cardinals and archbishops and bishops and priests and monks and friars, there's a great multitude of people. See, it's not the emperor that all the eyes are turned to this day, but John Huss. He does not return the gaze to the crowd, but he puts his hands together and he looks up to heaven. Now the bishop comes out he ascends to the pulpit, and he says, Shall we continue in sin? Heresy, he said, is a great sin, one of the greatest a man can commit. It destroys the church, and the magistrate should destroy those whom it originates. Turning to the emperor, the bishop thus addresses him. It'll be a just act, and it is the duty of your imperial majesty to execute this stiff-necked heretic. Then the bishop comes to the pulpit, and he says, you are to weigh this matter well. He says to the council, you 
are to not rest till you have burned such a sturdy heretic, one so stiff-necked in his errors. Then the bishop reads the charge against John Huss. You have disobeyed the Archbishop of Prague. You teach that there is a holy Catholic Church other than that which the Pope is the head. I do not doubt, Huss replies, that there is a holy Christian Church, which is a community of the elect both in this and in the other world to come. Silence! The Archbishop of Florence shouts, and John Huss knows his time is coming to an end. He goes upon his knees and he lifts his hands toward heaven because they will not hear him, but God will hear him. He has taught that a priest polluted with deadly sins cannot administer the sacrament of the altar, which is heretical. And he says that every act of a priest laden with deadly sins is an abomination in the sight of God. Ah, that hits home because the bishops, the archbishops, the cardinals and priests who are living with women to whom they have not been married never will forgive John Huss for saying that. And the charge is read and he is excommunicated by the Pope. John Huss turns toward the emperor and gazes calmly and steadily upon him. And he said, I came here in full confidence that no violence should be done to me. You invited me. The emperor now grows red in the face for he knows that John Huss came of free will. He knows that the safe conduct which he gave has been taken away from John Huss. Now with shame and confusion, he sits there with his eyes downcast. Everybody can see the reddening of his cheeks. John Huss has no trial, but an old bishop stands up and reads his sentence. He shall be burned to death. Once more, John kneels and prays and says aloud to everyone to hear, Lord God, pardon my enemies. Thou knowest that I have been falsely accused and unfairly sentenced. I pray thee in thy unspeakable mercy not to lay it to their charge. The bishops smile scornfully as if they could do anything wrong. Now the bishop shouts again, confess your errors, retract them, re repent, says one of the archbishops recant. But John Huss makes no reply to them and he turns to the people and he says to the people, the bishops want me to retract but if I were to do so I should be a liar before God. Silence you stiff-necked and wicked heretic, says the bishop. Well, his confidence is in God and his Savior, Jesus Christ. He knows that in moments he will be with God in heaven forever. Greater than the emperor, the pope, the archbishop is John Huss. Standing there beneath the vaulted roof of the old hall, none so calm, so quiet, so peaceful of heart as John soon to be one of Liberty's great sons. While the Emperor of Germany is shameful and insignificant, one word from the Emperor's lips will set the prisoner John Huss free, but the Emperor's heart and heart has yielded to the demand of those who are thirsting for the blood of John. Now the emperor says, let him be accursed of God and man eternally. And in the presence of the entire assembly, John says, I am willing to suffer for the truth in the name of Christ. Well, they place a paper cap on his head, a mock crown with figures of devils on it and the inscription, 
this is a heretic. Little does the emperor know that one day this will trouble him. Sooner or later, retribution follows crime. It may not be today or tomorrow, but it will come. And this emperor of Germany, the great emperor in Europe, will see his empire drenched in blood, towns and cities in flames, and the land a desolation for uttering those words. The procession moves once more, and out of the door stream the people. A fire is burning in the street, and the priests are heaping upon it the books written by John Huff and Dr. Wycliffe. John just smiles when he sees the parchment volumes just curling in the flames. He knows they can burn the, the books, but truth and liberty will still live on. None of the thousands around watching are so full of joy as he. The bishops are astonished. He goes on his way as if to a banquet, says one of the bishops. Through the streets, the people throng the sidewalks. They look down from the windows of the lofty buildings. The procession moves forward. And what is it that John Huss is saying? He says, I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up and has made my foes to rejoice over me. It is the 13th Psalm. They can burn his body, but what of that? His body is not him. He said, do not believe to the people that I have taught anything but the truth. There's no trembling of his lips, no whitening of his cheeks. Why should he fear? Because truth and liberty are eternal and will live when emperor and pope have passed away. Truth makes men free and it'll be glorious to die for liberty. The executioner stands with his torch. Renounce your error. John says, I have no heir. Glory to God on high, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. He begins to sing, and it's the same song which the angels sung above the pastors in Bethlehem. And he said, we praise thee, we bless thee, we worship thee, we glorify thee. We give thanks to you, O God, for your great glory. He is now singing Gloria and Excelsis. The smoke blinds him, the flames circle around his head, yet the voice goes on. He says, O Lord, thou takest away the sins of the world, have mercy on me. The flames wrap around his head, he falls upon his knees in the fire. The fire does its work and a heap of ashes is all that remains. Yes, they have gotten rid of John Huss. Have they really? By no means. It is the beginning of their troubles. It is the beginning of liberty. The cardinals and the archbishops do not forget that the man whom they have burned to death, John Huss, he was made a heretic by them because he read Dr. Wycliffe's books. The great Dr. Wycliffe has been dead a long while, so they cannot burn him, but it'll bring some satisfaction to let the world know what they would do to the doctor if he were alive. And so they issue an order to dig up his bones and burn them. Though the monks and have burned John Huss and the bones of Dr. Wycliffe, they have not put a stop to their preaching. For they are with the Lord, but their preaching goes on. 
Because the words spoken in behalf of truth, justice, and liberty never die. And we shall see by and by, after a hundred years have rolled away, how others have picked up the torch of liberty for its cause.